Ivan, thank you so much for joining me for this um, unusual pre-show, non-pre-show online event uh, happening between our two locations uh, to talk about Sondrion, which we are uh, going to go into rehearsals for on Monday. We're recording this on Friday, so we're nearly there. I'm frantically um, translating the surtitles and confirming all of them. I'm sure you're doing your last prep. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not frantic. I'm perfectly prepared. Oh, okay. Showing me up. Walk That's in. a joke. That was a joke. Um, Yvonne, can you just say who you are and then I'll say who I am and then we can crack on. Uh, yeah, I'm Iwan Davis. I'm uh, head of music for the festival and music director for this production. Who are you? Uh, who am I? Oh my God. Uh, I am Laura Attridge and I'm the director uh, for Sondrial. I'm very excited to be joining Buxton uh, for the first time. So why don't I start by saying a little bit about the piece and its composer, um, and then I'll hand over uh, to you to say a little bit more in depth about the music. Um, so Viardot's Cendrillon is a, a three-act chamber operetta based on the fairy tale of Cinderella. Uh, it features seven singers and was written specifically to be performed with piano in an intimate space, uh, like Viardot's own uh, salon in Paris, where the work was premiered in 1904. Vialdo herself was 83 at the time. And from what I've read about her, she was a pretty extraordinary individual. Uh, she was a singer, a pianist, a composer, a teacher, uh, and she was from an equally interesting family um, and with a life of incredible associations and encounters and working relationships uh, with many of the famous composers and musicians across her lifetime. So she played duets for Chopin, she created roles for Guno and Meyerbeer, Sanson dedicated Samson and Delilah to her after she, inclined, uh, she declined his invitation to sing the title role because she thought she was too old for it. Um, and so on and so forth. There's an incredible list of her um, relationships and accomplishments and, and inspirations. So she also spoke six languages fluently and she traveled all over the world before settling uh, back in France in 1870 with her husband. Uh, she taught at the Paris Conservatory there and she presided over her own music salon for 13 years in the Boulevard Saint-Germain. She primarily began to write music for her own students to help them develop vocally. So it doesn't really come as a surprise that uh, Sondrian has often been performed at conservatoires um, or by young singers. Um, I would recommend going and doing a bit of a Google if you want to go down the sort of rabbit hole of her extraordinary life and then also the, back, the biographies and backgrounds of her extraordinary family. Um, all her skill and her personality and all of this life experience can be found in Sondrion, I think, because we see all of it come together in this piece that she created so late in her life and she's bringing all of that personality to the piece, uh, to the music and the drama. So why don't I hand over for you to say a bit more about that music? Yeah, um, well, as it's an operetta or opera comique, as we say about French pieces, with dialogue, um, it combines musical numbers with dialogue. And, and the great thing about it is that each individual number is like a little masterclass in writing opera in miniature. Um, Viardot uses the full range of the forces available to her um, from unaccompanied folk songs, um, like the first aria that Sondrian sings, to duets, trios, and full ensembles. But of course, um, given the length of the piece, they're all compressed. Mm. So they're, they're like little, little jewels. Um, in terms of style, she was clearly influenced by her contemporaries, perhaps particularly Massenet and Sanson. Um, and you can hear that very clearly in, in the beautiful melodies she writes and in, in the lush harmonic language she uses. But I would argue also that the, the, the very sort of formal construction of the piece um, harks back further to Mozart and to Rossini. And that's perhaps not surprising given that her father, Manuel Garcia, the tenor, created, uh, amongst other roles, the role of Alma Viva in the Barbara Seville. And both her parents, as well as her brother and sister, were in the uh, United States premiere of Don Giovanni. So um, for me, she sort of straddles the classical style which she inherited and the style of the French romantics, which she was a part of. Um, there are also other little touches. Sometimes it sounds a bit like a cabaret song. So there's a hint of Poulenc or, or Sati maybe. Um, and there is even one brief passage of fanfare, which sounds a bit like Wagner. So it's a real melting pot of styles. 
Um, and as a singer, and as you said, a singing teacher herself, she writes extremely well for the voice and particularly for young voices, as I hope will be shown by the wonderful young singers in our cast. Um, she was also an accomplished pianist, and that's very clear in her piano writing. It sits very well under the fingers. A particular musical feature of our production is the casting of the prince as a trouser role um, sung by a mezzo rather than a tenor. And this means that the duet between Sondrion and the prince is a soprano mezzo duet. I think that's a particularly interesting combination. Um, the closeness of the voice types, the voices themselves mirroring the connection of the characters. And of course, those are the voice types that Massenet uses in his Sondrion as well. Um, so this is one version of the Cinderella story. And uh, as I've just mentioned, there are several others. Um, so Laura, maybe you'll tell us how the piece compares to those other versions. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, oh, I'm on your computer. I think that's exciting. I think I've stopped, it's okay. Technology. <laughs> so, um, so Cendrillon, uh, Viardot's Cendrillon is a really light-hearted take on the fairy tale of Cinderella. Um, and it draws primarily from the really famous version uh, written by Charles Perrault. Uh, but Viardot, who wrote the libretto and the spoken dialogue herself, uh, has added a very particular flavor to the story in a few ways. Um, and I've just got a list of a few here. I won't tell you all of them because uh, you'll have to come and see the production yourself. Um, so number one, instead of a uh, sort of cruel stepmother and horrible stepsisters, we have a father and two sisters. And it's really up for interpretation as to whether the relationship is biological or not, because Viardo gives us very little in the school to sort of nail that down and really confirm. There are a few clues here and there. Um, and I think one of the greatest challenges with the piece is to really clarify the nature of her relationship with the other characters in her household. So Viardo has, has really crucially softened the cruelty as well. Uh, so it's up to the director to really make sense of uh, all of this. What is her place in the household? Why is it so defined as separate from the Baron and his other daughters? So what's that all about? Um, second, and linked with this, uh, Viardo has added a bit of backstory for the Pictor du family, a comic subplot, which is quite underdeveloped um, and needs a bit of a helping hand from a production. Um, the backstory involves the Baron having previously been a greengrocer um, and the suggestion that he may have come about his title by sort of ne nefarious dealings. Um, but again, they are never specified. They're little morsels of ideas that, that she's added in without much development. Um, and finally, she adds a very operatic element to the plot line. The prince is seen initially disguised as a beggar who comes to the Pictor du household and discovers uh, through that Cendrillon's kindness towards the poor, which he of course remembers and appreciates later on in the piece. Um, and then for most of the rest of the opera, the prince remains in disguise, but this time by swapping clothes with his own chamberlain at the ball and thereafter. Uh, and of course, obviously, lovely little details that the audience uh, will see for themselves. So my challenge as a director, um, and as I've also been responsible for adapting the spoken dialogue into English, as well as translating the sung text for surtitles, was to take the piece, which is a little bit light on narrative detail sometimes, uh, and really show it at its best. So you've done a lot of work on the, on the script. Can you tell us a bit <laughs> more about that? Absolutely. So... Um, I was drawing from lots of different sources. Um, there's a, a really interesting set of documents that you have to sort of get your hands on in order to uh, actually put together a master set of um, text uh, in the French and then translate it into the English. Um, but in the process of doing that and sort of combing through, um, through the score and through the dialogue, what became really apparent to me um, was that lots of the extra elements added by Viardot are really uh, a reading of the fairy tale as a comment on class and, and moral character. So the Baron who's moved up in society, the Chamberlain who gets to play the Prince for the day, and on the other side, the Prince who wants to experience the world and seek relationships sort of outside the limitations of his royal status and his, his upper class. Um, so one of the devices I've introduced um, that's not in the original piece is the input of a narrator who helpfully just adds a bit more clarity here and there about the plot and sort of ties everything together to be coherent. Um, and I've chosen the narrator from amongst the characters in the piece, but I'm not going to say who, because you have to come and see the show. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that approach ties in very well with, 
with Viardot's own ideas for the piece. And she seems to have been pretty open, I think, about allowing the piece to be flexible in how it's interpreted. Um, an example of that is in Act Two, where she leaves space for extra music to be inserted, a bit like um, in the ball scene in, in Die Fledermaus. Um, so she writes in the score, Le morceau d'ensemble si après est suivi d'un concert dont la composition est laissée au choix des exutants, which means the ensemble pieces below, uh, and she's referring there to a, a lovely sextet. sextet. Uh, so the ensemble pieces below are followed by a concert, the composition of which is left to the choice of the performers. So that's very exciting. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to choose what we want to put on stage. So we, we talked about it at length, uh, about what options might be available to us for what to put there. And we wanted to do something that wasn't just a sort of concert of nice music, but that also furthered the narrative as much as possible. Um, so we didn't just sort of stop the opera while we had a concert and then moved on afterwards. Um, but we also wanted the music to um, feel appropriate within the language, the musical language of the piece. And we felt that ideally uh, the, the numbers should be sung in French as well. So having shelved uh, an initial idea of having some lurid coloratura of fireworks from the, from the sisters, um, we decided that our concert would feature a very well-known duet, which is the Barcarolle from Offenbach's Tales of Hoffmann, and then a probably less familiar aria from Massenet's Cherubin. Um, I'm sure that Viardot would have known both these works very well. The Barcarolle, as most of you will know, is a very simple tune, almost like a folk song. Um, and in the, in the opera, it's accompanied by a harp, um, which I'll do my best to imitate during this performance. Um, but our cast will perform it, I'm sure, as you've never seen it before. And I don't think I'll say any more now, but um, I'll, I'll leave that to your imaginations. Uh, and then Sherabin, the lovely aria from Sherabin, is uh, 